Hello. Hi there. And so, uh, nerve block uh, jokes aside, I do, I am going to need several volunteers who are into body modification in conference. So, <laughs> we shall see what it looks like. It's probably a job for an intern. <laughs> What's that? Would it be you doing the modifying? Oh, no, 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 no. Your, your, cla your, uh, your co colleagues will be doing it, so. So bear that in mind. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. My name's Andrew Shannon, and uh, the only reason I'm here really is because I was here once before. Uh, <laughs> they keep pulling me back in. Uh, I try to get out, but they keep pulling me back in. So uh, I'm currently the Altstown Fellowship Director and Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at University of Florida, Jacksonville. Uh, however, I used to be here, and I used to be here before that. Um, to let you know how damaged and old I am, I was classmates with the good Dr. Chertoff. Uh, I would like to thank, there's some pictures here that uh, Dr. Tina Sudnaram uh, helped me out with. She's finishing up her ultrasound fellowship at Cook County, um, and she was also a resident here. Um, and you guys, some, some of you, yeah, yeah, your class, there it is. Okay, so we'll go ahead and get started. I have no relevant financial, uh, period, I have no finances. <laughs> and uh, yay, Jacoby, okay. Uh, and just also in terms of our recording and other things, some images, uh, basically I just consulted a lot of Dr. Google. So some of these images are under copyright, so you can't get any money uh, for using them. Um, otherwise you get in trouble, um, which is why I chose to give my lecture here. <laughs> All right, there it is. Okay, but like I said, this is sort of the reason I'm here. Uh, I think this was LA's picture of, uh, of uh, the building when it was quasi new. And then of course, uh, this was our old emblem, our old sweatshirt for some reason. Um, we have the level one, the snake, the little baby, the fire, the hyperbarics. Um, and I always have to try to explain what this means. Is, a, a, is it a rebus puzzle or whatever it is? So basically you take the baby, you feed it to the snake, you have to set the snake on fire, you recycle the snake, you get a heartbeat back, and you go to the head of the class. <coughs> so. Uh, this is the, uh, the graduated responsibility situation. Most of the responsibility is here on the phone, and you can see the chief ready to spring into action. That's Raphael, of course, and the good Dr. Shram. <coughs> this is uh, Dr. Alvarez's last day as a, as a resident here, so he decided to uh, take the floor uh, buffer and just sort of wander around. Parag there is in the background. <coughs> this, I uh, hope we still do this. This is the very important passing of the Ramsey Rod. This is from Susie Chun to Derek Bazemore. Um, uh, and we'll just take a moment to everyone flex in remembrance of Bazemore, because that's what was going on there. And you may not be able to recognize him. Dr. Michael Jones, working urgent care. Aw, cargo pants. All right, good. <laughs> So again, questionable co colleagues, Dr. Eiding is now in charge of things I hear, some, in some <laughs> way or another. Um, that, is a, that is a simulation uh, uh, posterior. That's posterior simulation from Dr. Megredician. And then, uh, yeah, a few other folks. And then finally, uh, this is just a series of Andrews that was required back when I was here to have at least two Andrews in every Jacoby situation. <laughs> here we went up over, over and above when we got the, the requisite three. <clears throat> and this is sort of how we used to do charting. And that's what's called chart review. <laughs> and then uh, Stephanie and uh, Yana uh, doing a little bit of ultrasound. Aww. And then this is where I work now. It's basically Jacoby South. Uh, this was us this past February uh, with uh, uh, Gurgis and Codpe um, down in Jacksonville. That's a whole lecture. No, okay. So goals and objectives. We'll describe the indications and roles for common ultrasound guided blocks, understand some safety and hygiene issues, uh, identify relevant anatomy, so pretty pictures, and then appreciate the role, like when should you be doing this, who should be doing this, that sort of thing. But my main goal is to try to avoid this conference situation, uh, which sometimes happens even to uh, the best of us and then sometimes me as well. So uh, try it. we'll try to keep you all awake. One more time. I said you went all out with the blanket. Yeah, I don't remember getting the blanket. <laughs> so 
so. Are you sure? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot going on underneath the blanket. All right. Okay. So why do we do ultrasound guided blocks? Because it makes us look like doctors and everything. No. Because you don't need to do sedation, right? So potentially you may have uh, fewer personnel requirements. Patients do quite well with these when we when we uh, even if we do them poorly, they do quite well with them. We just didn't do uh, didn't uh, weren't successful, but still you don't have uh, when you have a non-successful sedation. Uh, potentially you've ended up with an intubated patient. So there's a little bit of a different uh, different. Um, uh, um, spectrum of, of uh, problems there. You can target the thing that you want and then uh, in general ultrasound guided uh, or nerve blocks but then ultrasound guided nerve blocks will shorten your ED stay and this is important in the sort of this era of trying to decrease opiate use and sort of the opiate free ED all that sort of stuff and patients like them. So we're emergency physicians, it's just like, oh, I'm never going to be able to get this figured out. Oh, what's an ultrasound block? What's an ultrasound, right? So your job is to adapt and overcome, so you, 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 you fix it. The motto of the uh, Academy of Emergency Medicine is if you don't know, have a go. Um, <laughs> not really, but close enough. Okay, so when do you block? Anytime someone's trying to hit you, there will be more throughout the lecture. <laughs> Acute pain management, uh, even a couple ugly pain managements. Procedural anesthesia, alternatives to narcotics, alternative to procedural sedation. Okay, so uh, in terms of uh, every place that I have stolen, uh, adopted material from, um, this is one of the very good ones. So Highland uh, out in uh, uh, Alameda has a great ultrasound uh, curriculum and a bunch of stuff online for free. Certainly take a look at some of what they've done. Also the New York Society for Regional Anesthesia is a very good resource that's free and open access and all that stuff. Um, other things like Neuraxium, uh, a few other websites if you want to get into this, the Ultrasound Podcast does it. And then you actually have several uh, apps that you can download on your phone, everything from uh, Block Guru to Nerve Whiz to whatever to just sort of help you remember, oh yeah, that's what I'm supposed to be doing when I get in. Uh, to the uh, uh, which nerve does what kind of thing. So <clears throat> this is sort of the stuff that should be bread and butter. This is the stuff we should be doing all the time. Um, shoulder dislocations, clavicle fractures, proximal humerus, distal radius, digit and in hand injuries, hip fracture dislocation, and then low energy and ankle fractures. These are very safe uh, conditions to have uh, uh, regional anesthesia used on. And of course, all of this stuff kind of depends on good communication with your consultants, whether it's orthopedics, <clears throat> anesthesia, neurology or neurosurgery to whoever is sort of doing these things uh, in, your, in your department. But this is well within the wheelhouse of emergency medicine. Why, when, why low energy, Dr. Shannon? Aha, because, uh, <clears throat> so why low energy? So what are you doing with a nerve block is you're basically decreasing, <laughs> shisa, you're basically uh, decreasing your, uh, your ability to feel what's going on, right? So if you have a high energy injury, in particular in an extremity, which is sort of going to be the one that you're going to lend itself to being blocked, that high energy translates to tissue damage, which translates to edema, which translates to compartment syndrome, so okay? So you're worried about possible neurovascular compromise. Correct, yeah, you're worried about neurovascular compromise and your inability to, to detect progression, right? Um, and yeah, so we'll see some of that. So active infection, duh, don't put a needle through, uh, you know, cellulitis into a joint, all that good stuff. If they're allergic to an amide or an ester, use the other one. Risk for compartment syndrome, a pre-existing neurologic deficit would be sort of a relative contraindication. Um, extreme obesity, that's sort of more of a technical uh, contraindication. Anticoagulation, yeah, probably, so again, relative. But certainly an uncooperative patient or a patient with altered mental status who can't sort of report to you that things are changing, that they're having pain with injection, that is not someone that you should block necessarily. So these sort of fall into that category. This is again from Highland where they talk about <clears throat> how to block after consultation with your ortho, whatever service is going to be seeing this patient after the fact. And those are ones that you're starting to get a little bit, uh, a little bit more excited about. So femoral shaft, for example, as opposed to femoral neck or hip fracture. So lower leg tibia fracture, forearm foot fractures, open fractures, uh, associated vascular injury, and high energy fractures. Basically all those things are high energy fractures, right? This is uh, less bueno than a little fracture up here because you slipped on the sidewalk, right? Same thing here, <laughs> you know, if your fracture involves the tibial shaft, uh, a, a 
a little bit higher above the ankle, you may not be interested in doing this. Like a fractured dislocation of the distal ankle, sure. But sort of as you get sort of into the tibial shaft, you're starting to talk about a lot more energy and a lot more difficulty with some of the smaller compartments of the leg. Okay, so uh, this is just a big chart which basically says you got options in terms of what you're choosing. So in general, I think that when people are first starting out doing ultrasound blocks, uh, lidocaine is fine and that's probably what I'd recommend. If for no other reason, then lidocaine wears off the fastest, right? So if you're concerned about sort of a prolonged block or you're concerned about an exam question and your ability to reassess the patient, lidocaine is probably a pretty good choice for that. Um, you have all these other things, bupivacaine or a mix of lidocaine and bupivacaine is something that people commonly do as well. Okay. So typically you're going to have, uh, there'll be recommendations for the different kind of blocks with how much you're going to use, but the idea about ultrasound is you don't have to sort of just, you know, slather them in, uh, in, uh, in fluid. So you're only using a few cc's for each of the forearm nerve blocks. The femoral, however, is a little bit different. It depends on what kind of femoral block you're doing, including a fascia iliaco, which is actually a compartment block or the three-in-one block. And in that case, you want a whole bunch of volume, and we'll talk about why. But you don't necessarily want all that volume to be, uh, you don't necessarily want all the medication that would be in that volume. So you can actually take your lidocaine or whatever you're using and dilute it out with normal saline to get a larger volume. And we'll see why that's the case. Tibial or distal sciatic popliteal block. Uh, again, five to cc's, that kind of stuff. Okay, so let's talk about the anatomy a little bit. So this is the, uh, this is, uh, the coaxial cable that we call the nerve. Um, basically, epineurium just sort of binds all these guys together. There's all this little connective tissue in there. Inside that are the little mitochondria, which are basically the, uh, the uh, uh, um, nerve, uh, oh gosh, uh, fibrils. I don't remember what they're called, come on. Ah. Anyway. Um, Fascicles, holy moly, these are fascicles. Uh, and they're surrounded by the perineum and inside you've got those little tubular guys. Whew. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty close. I pulled that one out at the very end there. I'm glad you guys are okay with it. So, um, especially because it's on the very next page. Uh, the hypochoic fascicles are within the perineum on short axis. This can look a little bit like a honeycomb and long axis it looks a little bit like uh, a coaxial cable. Um, so here you are in short axis, this sort of like little fuzzy wuzzy, that's your nerve. Okay. Uh, the other thing that's going to be interesting uh, component of sonoanatomy is something called anisotropy. And it's uh, a geeky fancy physics word that ultrasound people love. So if uh, you're super excited by this, you may be interested in doing an ultrasound fellowship. But essentially it refers to the property of a material that will have a, a variable reflection of the sound waves based on the angle of incidence. And if that just made you conk out, then fair enough. Just know it looks brighter or darker. If that made you very excited, then uh, talk to me if you want to do a fellowship the uh, year after next. <coughs> so here we are, the median nerve at the mid forearm. We're going to see that this guy here on that side is in transverse. We can see the little honeycomb as he's sort of in the, the tissues there. And then on his other side is that's that same nerve in long axis. And you can see him look sort of like uh, these nice linear patterns. Uh, going on here. So here's your nerve in long axis and hopefully we all got that that's my nerve here and actually yeah that's actually my my nerve uh, um, in short axis. Okay so this is an example of anisotropy. Here we are down sort of at the wrist and as I'm just basically changing the angle of incidence with the ultrasound beam you'll see that some of these guys are getting brighter and darker and some of them are staying the same. Here's your artery and actually here's your nerve right next to. Here, 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 these are all your tendons. And so in the beginning there, it looked like this guy looked relatively similar, right? In terms of how bright it was. But as I'm sort of changing my angle, the guys that are tendons, which have a higher degree of anisotropy or a higher degree of variability depending on the angle, they sort of get brighter or darker. And when they get super dark, it's not like they're ruptured or anything, that's just how they behave. So that's something when you're looking at your Achilles tendon, for example, depending on where you are with that Achilles tendon, if you're angling this way versus straight on, you're going to have a decreased reflection and it doesn't mean that there's a rupture there. So that's a very common mistake that people make initially. But this sort of fanning back and forth is how you can identify the nerve versus the tendon 
diamonds, depending on where you're looking. There's two techniques. There's the out-of-plane technique, and there's the uh, in-plane technique. Out-of-plane, essentially, the needle approaches the plane of vision from outside that plane. So you're in the skin here, and you're going into the plane that you've created with your ultrasound. Uh, generally, for superficial stuff, um, or for problems where there's a right-left mistake, uh, that's the approach that you would use, and it's probably the approach that you guys are taught most commonly for your uh, ultrasound-guided central lines, that kind of stuff. The in-plane technique um, is uh, what I prefer, how I prefer to do most of my procedures these days. Um, uh, where that is, you see here that the needle is in the plane that you create with your ultrasound transducer at all times. So you're basically, instead of coming into it like this, you're basically following into it like that. So you can see the needle tip at all times. And it helps with needle tip uh, visualization and it helps to avoid past pointing or going too deep. Of course, if you've got your IJ and your carotid and they're right next to each other and you're going in long axis, very small movements here can take you to one side or the other. So if they're right next to each other, maybe you do want to do this out of plane technique so you avoid a right-left mistake. If your artery and your vein are right on top of each other, you might want to choose a long axis so you can see your needle tip and know how deep you have to go. So there's just different situations that calls for different techniques. Certainly the technique that you're familiar with should be the one you should try to use. So when you're setting this up, uh, you know, nerve blocks tend to not be emergent procedures, so treat them like procedures that you have the ability to sort of prepare for success, right? You want to set up your workspace ergonomically. It's just essentially saying that you want to have the patient in one area, um, kind of like the ultrasound. If the patient's here, your target's here, you want your ultrasound screen there, so you're not doing this the whole time as you're sort of poking with a large needle. It doesn't, uh, doesn't induce confidence. Um, so just create the space that you want. Uh, similarly, whenever you're doing an ultrasound, you want to make sure that your screen, right left on the screen, is the same as right left in the world. So if I'm moving this way with my ultrasound transducer here, then I want my indicator to be on this side so that a move in this direction correlates to move on this way on the screen. Does that make sense? If I'm flipped around, I'll say, oh, I need to go that way, so I'll go this way and whoop, I'll be on the wrong side. Okay, the way I like to confirm that <laughs> is actually what I call the hover, um, which is to say I'm right about to do the procedure and at the last minute I just sort of tap to make sure left is left and right is right. I've actually seen people kind of do, okay, that's good, and then go, right? <laughs> right, I've seen it, so it's awkward. So just hover and tap up. Okay, so pre-scan the area that you're interested in, right? You don't want to find out that there's a thrombus after you've gotten them all sterile because you're at Jacoby, so even sterile gowns are, are, are not, uh, not cheap. Um, but you want to make sure that you don't get in trouble. The idea there, basically just plan ahead. Okay, you, this is a clean technique, right? This is a sterile technique. You're injecting something deep into the skin. Please don't inject bacteria and infection and all that stuff. Um, and the other thing I'll say about most of your procedures generally is I feel like you'll do, have a better success if you have two procedures. The first procedure is getting through the skin. And then once you're through the skin, like the very superficial skin, you can think about your other procedure. Okay, because usually what happens is I'm getting in, I'm getting, oh, there we go. Oh, okay, you just combined your two procedures and now you've got a lung biopsy. So you want to be careful about just sort of getting through the skin first and then sort of going on. And that's especially important here because <coughs> um, I, was, I can't think of a joke of it, but uh, do muscles have C fibers? Not really, right? So when you're in there and you've sort of got this big laceration and you're pulling muscle belly together and you're using a vicral, do you do additional lidocaine in the belly of the muscle? Not really. Like they feel some proprioception, they feel some pulling pressure, that kind of stuff, but it's usually not a sharp, sharp pain. So essentially all of, your, all of that stuff is at the surface um, and uh, once you sort of get in there, uh, you actually, uh, people do uh, okay with it. And then just finally, the, the needle tip should be oriented such that it gives you a better uh, signal. And then I will send out a handout of some of this stuff uh, for you guys to look at uh, later. So that's why in this whole uh, patient tolerance thing, that's why you put your wheel, your Lido wheel or Emla or whatever you want initially, get through that skin and then sort of go a little bit deeper. And of course here we're talking like millimeters to centimeters, right? We're not talking uh, uh, crazy stuff. You enter, you approach the target, don't try to hit anything that pulsates. 
You can use a little bit of a test aliquot of anesthetic to localize if you want. If you're having trouble with your needle visualization and you know you're superficial and you know you have a clean field, you can give a little bit of an injection and as long as it's not like under pressure and you sort of see some of your uh, lido in the field, then you can uh, move forward with confidence. Try not to put in air. This is sort of a good example of the nerve is here. They're starting to put a little bit of lido here. The nerve is still here. And where did their lido go? Well, for those playing the home game, this is air artifact, right? So this is dirty shadowing of air. And they just sort of put the bubble that was in their syringe in the patient. It doesn't matter. It just makes it harder to see your needle tip. OK. And then you install the uh, local anesthetic around the nerve. Um, there's taught to sort of give you that donut sign that's circumferential around the nerve. That's probably less important. It's probably more important to make sure you just have longitudinal spread along the nerve. We'll get there. Local anesthetic and then some air. Okay. So obviously you need an ultrasound to do an ultrasound guided block. You can do an aspirating syringe or a dental syringe if you have them. They're more expensive, so you probably don't have them. But it certainly helps in terms of control, right? You can sort of pull back and push with the same one, same, uh, same hand. And then finally, uh, there's a little, uh, some issues with needles. Uh, blunt tip needles are kind of the way to go for almost, uh, for most of your uh, procedures, and I would include actually your spinal uh, tap with that. What comes in your kit are the quinky, which are the sort of cutting needles. Um, you can think about sort of uh, what you want to do about that going forward, but a lot of places that you'll end up working are going to have like blunt tipped needles. So I would recommend trying that out if you can to just sort of get a feel of what that feels like because it is a different sort of feeling. Like your pops and things like that, you're going to feel a lot more with your blunt tipped or your pencil tipped needles. Um, with your blunt tip needles or your pencil needles, basically uh, here you're going to have a tougher time getting through that skin, which is why you want that lidocaine there. Um, but then you sort of push through the skin and then you're basically just pushing through the rest uh, of the uh, sub and muscle to get to your target. Yo. You don't, you don't have to. Uh, I mean, it, you know, it, it depends. Like, you know, if you've got like just really ridiculous thick skin for some reason and you're having to do a certain kind of procedure, that's, you know, that's what you're, that's what it's in the central line kit for. Um, for the most part, uh, once you've sort of numbed up that, that superficial skin, you can actually get in with the, uh, with the needle relatively well. Um, but it does require a little bit of a modification. Like you don't sort of try to go in uh, into the skin toward the nerve kind of like this. You're sort of just getting through the skin and then you're reorienting and going in. So it's a little bit different. <clears throat> okay, so a few other things to talk about in terms of increasing your safety. Um, and that's always the concern when uh, consultants are talking about you shouldn't be doing anything in the ER because it's not safe. Um, you know, the argument is also, well, it's also not safe not to do things in the ER. <laughs> That's why ER has started to exist. Uh, but uh, it is true. Uh, the best way to shut down a program of, new, of doing something new and innovative is to have like a complication, right, or a bad outcome, and almost immediately, oh, see, you can't do it. So this is just sort of another thought about additional uh, safety, pressure monitoring. So they actually have commercial pressure monitors. And the idea is essentially if you're entering into the nerve, which is what everyone is concerned about, um, then your pressures are going to be higher because you're getting resistance. And if you've got a whole bunch of resistance, you should probably stop doing what you're doing, um, uh, which is why I stay at home and play video games all day as opposed to anything else because the lesson is never try. Um, but no, so you want to avoid extrafascial injection or intraneural injection. Your pressure should be low. Um, and once you get to sort of 15, 20, you're starting to sort of get to a pressure that indicates that you're in a structure you don't want to be in. Okay, so there's the compressed air column and the, uh, the other technique. This is actually just uh, um, a device that, oh, it's almost off the screen, uh, a device that basically will give you a pressure um, needle here, syringe here. So you're just sort of injecting and this guy sort of raises up like a tire gauge um, to sort of tell you what your pressure is. Another one that's sort of a, a halfway way to do it is this sort of compression of the column of air here. So essentially if you're able, you put air as well as your local anesthetic in the back of your syringe there. And if you're able to compress this air column up to 50% without sort of really injecting a whole bunch, then probably the pressure that you're fighting against is too high and you need to reposition. Okay, does that make sense? 
It's sort of a rule of thumb kind of thing. The recommendation, obviously, is to use something where you actually get a quantitative number, just because it's a little bit sharper, a little bit more precise. And then the nerve stimulator uh, is sort of used less and less, especially as ultrasound has come into view. But historically, and and also. Uh, um, uh, a lot of anesthetists use this to ensure proximity to the nerve. So you basically have a bunch of parameters in terms of the amperes that it's setting out. Um, and it's kind of like pacer capture. So you have to set what your amperes are and you sort of uh, uh, set the duration of your pulse, that kind of thing. Uh, and you try to determine uh, how close you are to the nerve on the basis of the electrical impulse coming back and on the basis of a motor response. Okay? The issue here primarily for, uh, uh, for us in the ED is that it requires specific equipment, right? insulated needles and a nerve stimulator. Good. Okay. You should have anesthesia within about 15 minutes, depending on the block. You need to monitor the patient for at least 30 minutes following the block. Okay. So this isn't something that you just sort of block and they go upstairs and by the time uh, the nurse rounds on them like two hours later, you're just like, oh, there was a complication. Right. So you want to monitor them for that. Um, let them know that they're going to have no sensation for up to several hours, obviously. Consider splinting it to protect them from hurting themselves. And this is particularly important for folks who get a block, get a procedure, and are discharged. Like, just let them know what to expect, right? <clears throat> um, expected block recovery, how to watch for complications. And then also, think about skin marking your inpatients just to avoid confusion. So, you know, that hip was done, just a little skin marker or on a, a tegaderm or whatever, you know, uh, femoral nerve block at this time with lidocaine. Put it in the chart, put it on the patient, and then people, under, you know, won't give you a call. It's like, oh, they can't move their foot. Well, it's like, well, we actually just blocked them, okay? Because you'll be handing these patients off to other teams, so just be aware that your team that you're handing off to may not be as aware as you are of a particular thing that happened in the ED. So complications, prolonged procedure times, block failure, uh, you can vagal down, right? So vagal, uh, as well as another complication, if you're injecting a bunch of lidocaine into someone, what might another complication happen from that? Toxicity. Toxicity, right. And so one of the ones that we're most concerned about is cardiac toxicity, like lidocaine is used for cardiac uh, dysrhythmias. Um, so you want to have them on a monitor for all that sort of stuff. Um, nerve injury is the one that people get excited about. It's rare, but it's non-zero depending on the block. Anything from 0.03% to 3% of a prolonged uh, paresthesia um, can happen. But most of these paresthesias resolve relatively quickly. Ways to try to avoid this is uh, you enter where you want to be and just allow for diffusion. You don't want to necessarily, the goal is not to have your needle right on the nerve um, because if you aim for that, if you uh, excel at that, then your needle will be too close to the nerve, right, or within the nerve. So, you know, start away and then sort of work your way toward as your field becomes clear with the lidocaine that you're putting in. Always know where the tip is. That's good. That's good life advice. Um, and uh, thinking, thinking of the Titanic. I don't know what you guys are. All right, whatever. Um, and then non-cutting needles are thought to help. And then motor blockade can potentially be a complication. In particular, if uh, yeah, yeah, we're filming this. Great. I'll make it classy. Uh, motor blockade, in particular, if you're not aware of it, right? or not anticipating it. And then last, or local anesthetic, anesthetic systemic toxicity, a bunch of stuff, right? CNS, the tinnitus, metallic, taste, tingling, paresthesias. Um, it's not scrambroid, it's the lidocaine you just injected into their vas vasculature. Um, seizures, and then the uh, hemodynamic stuff. How do you treat it? You treat it with intralipid, okay? So intralipid is sort of like the new hotness from toxicology, and I didn't know Vince would be here, otherwise I would have just said that and moved on uh, so that I couldn't be corrected. But this is sort of the treatment. I would recommend, or I, I other people have recommended, and I agree with the rationale, that if you're doing procedural, uh, if you're doing regional nerve blocks with volumes of anesthetic, for example, for your fascia iliaca block, that the intralipid be available in the Pyxis. This is not something that should come from pharmacy eventually, that kind of stuff, okay? This is something that you should have on hand because it's a very quick and very effective antidote to what we're talking about. You hear people talk about the fact that level propofol is also lipid-based, and there's some lipid in propofol. The concentration of propofol, uh, propofol drip is not enough to sort of uh, treat this, uh, this last. Do you have uh, anything else or close enough? OK. Whew. 
So obviously you don't want to put a needle through an artery unless that's the goal. <laughs> Multiple injections. You usually don't need to sort of get that donut around. Usually you can get to where you need to be and if you're in the right plane um, and through the fascia <laughs> you get through, it'll usually sort of bathe the nerve with the amount of volume that you're putting in. Injecting directly into your nerve may contribute to residual paresthesias, but interestingly enough, it may not. Um, there's some evidence to suggest uh, that uh, it's not as, it, the, the post-block paresthesias are not only solely or even directly related to intraneural injection. So there's a bunch of other things that go into it. Um, it's kind of like everything in medicine, once we start to really look at it, we realize um, we don't kind of know everything about this. So uh, that's interesting, but that's, that's the, the thought, probably contributes. Don't, uh, failing to communicate to the patient or the consultant uh, expectations regarding the block, that's a real issue. And then common types of blocks. We're going to be talking about the fascia iliaca, forearm blocks, the uh, popliteal, the distal sciatic block, um, and scaling block. And I think with that, I'm going to have, who's our volunteer? I want to be someone who can take their jacket off. I need some arms. Can anyone show me arms? Maninder. Maninder? No? We can avoid this. It's more sort of for your, more sort of to wake you guys up with fear as opposed to uh, as opposed to anything that's going to be useful. Because you can certainly look at the picture, but no, 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 no. It's just drawing. So sorry. Uh, yeah, that's probably should be fair. Okay. And now I need three other volunteers. You're up. Okay. One more. <laughs> All right. And if you could take your uh, your jacket off there. Which one are you? Uh, green. Yeah, okay. Oh. Ooh, purple. You don't get one, unfortunately. <laughs> well, you're welcome to it. Go for it. You, you, you got it. Okay. So, <laughs> ready? You're drawing on me. Now, I would like... Based Five on points. Use 40 minutes. No, this is all new knowledge. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my friend, what's your name? Gordon. Gordon, I would like you to show me the distribution of a radial nerve block. Draw. Go. Yo, go. I go. Go. I go. go. <laughs> I would like you, and the point of this is that we don't know, like, okay. right? So that's the yeah. point. Oh, oh lesson learned. Show me the distribution of a tibial nerve block. Uh, it's below the knee. <laughs> okay, show me on the right arm the distribution of an interscaling block. Yeah. Where's the scaling? The scaling is above the clavicle. So the point of this is that um, uh, one is to, to make everyone feel very uncomfortable about the fact that this is actually happening, but two, um, to uh, reinforce the fact that a lot of your anatomy, go for it, just go, 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 go. They're all washable. They're all washable Crayolas. Tibial, radial, and scaling. So if I'm doing a radial nerve block, if I'm doing a distal sciatic or tibia block, you can use dots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Go for it. Go for it. Go for it. Is it the front? Is it the back? That kind of stuff. So the reason we're talking about this, right? No idea. Is because these nerves, good, good. These nerves are actually, these blocks are actually the blocks that I would recommend you guys get comfortable with or familiar with, right? And there's sort of specific indications for them, right? So, for example, the fascia iliaca, which we're not doing that distribution today, uh, is, is good for your hip blocks, right? But is it good for your um, mid shaft femur blocks? Is it good for, right? Is it good for an ankle? You're up here, the nerve's up here. So those are the kinds of things that, you know, they, I'm, we're sort of joking a little bit, but they're relatively, um, uh, once you become familiar with them a little bit, they're relatively simple, right? And there's certain indications. So for example, if I'm doing a uh, radial nerve block, do I expect to have good anesthesia for a Collie's fracture reduction? Not really, right? Especially if I'm at the forearm. Okay, so those kinds of things are also going to help you out in terms of looking to say, all right, there are a few things that I'm going to use a block for. 
In particular, like if my hand is all chewed up with a dog bite kind of situation, then maybe a radial nerve would be useful, right? Uh, if I've got, again, that distal uh, ankle as opposed to that tibia fracture, then maybe my pop block or, or even my posterior tibial block would be useful. All right, let's see what we came up with. All right, let me see radian. Outstanding, right? So close enough, right? Thumb, dorsal, and any into the fingers or no? Uh, oh. You tell me. It should be digits. No, median is on the palmar surface, so it should be one, two, mm. and a half. Cool. <laughs> All right. Because that can matter, right? Let's say you just put your head in a bread slicer. It's a smiley face. What'd you do? It was. It was. Yeah, it's kind common. of a little bit. draws penises on me. <laughs> <laughs> it's a phallus, and the words mama didn't love me. And then uh, underneath here on the tibia, I there's a line. I don't even know. Like, <laughs> is it above the line, I, behind the line? I, all right. I just good job. <laughs> we'll, we'll, all right, we'll we'll, we'll qualify. Um, and clearly, uh, clearly, I need to get I need to get the, the pins pens back from Chertov more than anyone. <laughs> just, uh, and then the ombuds person will see you after class. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. So yes, these are actually washable markers. They should wash off and all that sort of stuff. So let's talk about the fascia iliaca with the time we have left. Within one to two months. Okay, woof. All right, so uh, we're going to do this one. I think it's uh, typical, and then we'll sort of try to blaze through the rest. Okay, so indications, fracture of the femur, patella, patella tendon injuries, hip fracture, femur fracture, uh, I repeated myself there, abscess laceration, um, and in particular, abscess laceration of the anterior medial thigh. So some folks who you're just like, oh man, that is a big pool of pus. A lot of these regional anesthesia blocks are actually worth, uh, worth uh, learning about and, and doing. <clears throat> the big one here though, is we're talking about medial, because all of this is off the femoral, Right? The lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh, not so much. Okay? That can come off as high as T12. So that's not one that you're going to get with your block. So you're basically getting your anesthesia of the anterior thigh, the knee, and the femur. Patella fracture, right? Like you can potentially just do this block, and people do uh, a lot better with it. In terms of the femur, that's again something that we talked about from the original. Uh, from the earlier slides, maybe that's something that needs to be done in consultation with your consultants because of it being a high risk injury, right? It takes a lot to break your femur. Good. Okay. So, innervation of the hip and knee. Uh, this picture is here just to make you afraid, but you don't need to know it. You basically need to know what you're using it for, right? With your hip, your hip is actually innervated by three, sorry, three nerves, the femoral nerve, sciatic nerve, and the obturator nerve, okay? Um, this is why the uh, fascia iliaca, or the three-in-one block, is uh, something that uh, people talk about or uh, a phrase that you might have heard. So that's what we need. We need to hit all of these guys to get good hip innervation. If you're just doing a traditional femoral nerve block, then you're not going to have, that's not what you would use for a hip fracture. Okay, and so that's why we're going to be talking about the fascia iliaca. And then we said about the cutaneous, lateral cutaneous nerve of the thigh. Um, that's the lateral aspect of the thigh. So if you've got a big lack to the outside of the thigh, your femoral nerve block isn't going to help you. Okay, so little tricks like that. And then does anyone remember myalgia paresthetica? So that's sort of the, uh, that's sort of your lateral thigh um, tingly and all that sort of stuff due to compression where it, where it, uh, where it uh, uh, juts out from. So uh, if you remember that condition, you can remember that that guy's not covered by the femoral. Okay? All right, so what is it? It's a compartment block, and basically you're trying to have your anesthetic seep back into the lumbar plexus to hit your obturator, uh, to hit your other two nerves. Um, and that's why we actually, uh, this is actually thought of as a very high volume block. You don't necessarily, in particular, um, this is the only one where I would sort of do the, you should do it on all of them, but this is the one where I think it's important to do the math of your lidocaine, of your local toxicity, and your toxic dose, just because you want sort of high volumes, and if you're sort of getting to the point where you're approaching a dose that you don't want to give with a lidocaine, that's fine, but you still need that volume, and you can make that up with saline. <laughs> and the reason is you're looking for a spread over an area. Okay. And the femoral nerve is blocked uh, more often than the obturator or lateral cutaneous because it depends on retrograde, retrograde flow back up under the uh, inguinal crease to get sort of your higher, uh, your higher um, blocks. 
So this is sort of where uh, this is sort of your femoral three and one, that blue there. Okay. Um, the uh, the other idea with the fascia iliaca and the reason that people talk about it as as the three and one block in order to help facilitate spread. Does it work? Does it not work? Eh, maybe, maybe not. But the idea is after your injection, you actually hold pressure at the area distal. Um, and you can even put them in a little bit of uh, head downenberg, right, Trendelenburg, uh, to um, help the anesthetic sort of seep back kind of up into the lumbar plexus where it belongs. Um, you'll see that technique described. That's what they're talking about in terms of why they, the rationale for, for doing that. So, um, you know, uh, I actually don't know of a study that shows that your fascia iliaca, if you do that, is better. I'm, I'm sure there is one. I just, uh, I, I don't know the actual research on that. Sorry. Okay, so pre-scan, right, with a high linear frequency probe, look for your contraindications to block, look for duplicate anatomy, look for things that'll get you in trouble. And here, this is the anatomy that you're going to be looking for. All right, so venous to midline, good. Lateral out here. Uh, this is sort of your iliopsoas muscle. Fascia lata up here. Femoral nerve is here. There's a separate vascular femoral sheath there. So essentially, you're looking to try to get this guy here. And this is sort of what it looks like under Sono. Again, artery, nice round vein, compressible, thick wall, nerve, right? And so here, your iliopsoas is kind of down here, coming up this way. So this is going to be your lateral to medial approach to the nerve. Okay. Okay, it's a clean or a sterile procedure, so use a tegaderm, use sterile gel, um, depending on uh, what your manipulation is. You can potentially use sterile gloves as well, but otherwise just sort of clean technique is, is appropriate. Um, supine cardiac monitor, get your local uh, uh, wheel taken care of. Um, prep, sterile transducer cover, either like that tegaderm or just use a full transducer cover like you would for central line. And then you just sort of go in laterally in the long axis with the indicator of the patient right, make sure you got the nerve, and then use an in-plane approach. Um, it's just a better, uh, um, it's just easier to see that tip again. And then you aim for deep to the nerve. Inject a couple cc's to make sure you're where you need to be. Reposition in advance. Once you're in the right position, you can go ahead and do your full volume injection. Your nerve should be sort of seen separated away, sort of the hydrostatic dissection, which is basically like you'll see those tissues move away um, um, and become a little bit more crisp as you surround them with essentially contrast, right, with the fluid that you're putting in because liquid uh, or water density is the friend of ultrasound as opposed to air, right? All right, so we'll take a look here maybe. Okay, so there you've got your great saphenous, your arterial bifurcation, common femoral. Here, they're just sort of going right at it. This is pretty, uh, you know, he's right on sort of the nerve here. Um, so it gives a little test bolus there, maybe a little bit of bubbles. Kind of keeps going deep. Starts to throw in a bunch of this lidocaine here. And you're starting to separate out some of the tissues, including this sort of the femoral nerve here, and getting it surrounded a little bit. And uh, remember, in this space, there's going to be some, t uh, some tissue like fat or whatever else, and it's basically just going to be there. But you see that as he's injecting here, the fluid is coming up this way. So that's the magic of a fascial compartment, right? Like, that's sort of why that's happening. Can you go to the beginning just to replay the video, just to see what it looks like before the injection starts? Sure. So artery, your nerve is actually considered to be in this triangle here, oh, okay. right? So, so he's right so he's going. He's basically trying to go right under it. Yeah. Would you recommend doing that? I mean, I know you're talking of like. I'd probably start a little bit, especially when you're first starting out. I'd start a little bit further away. I'd even sort of go into the iliopsoas, okay. and just sort of go underneath that uh, fascial thing, um, fascial uh, uh, division, and just sort of inject. And you say, oh, okay, well, I'm well under. You know, and then you can sort of move back and move away because if you're sort of in this area and you're in the fascial space, it'll it'll sort of seep down some. So that's why sort of like those initial sort of slow go injections are what you do, and then when you see that you're in the right spot, you can go ahead and do your volume. Using like a 60 cc 
Yeah, you can use like, you'd use like a 60 cc syringe, and you could also potentially use, and you'll see some of these pictures. They use a little bit of uh, 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 tubing, right? So essentially, you've got your your needle, in particular, those little blunt tip anesthesia needles, with your transducer. You do the sky in, and then the tubing goes to your needle, and that either is to a I was about to say confederate, but I meant assistant. Um, uh, or you just sort of have that on the field, and then once you're in place, you know, you can sort of leave your ultrasound and, 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 and look and make sure. But the idea of having that third, per, uh, the second person there to help with that third hand so you're seeing it and you're holding the, the needle steady is, is what's recommended. The benefit of that is that when you're injecting, you're not moving your needle. Correct. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like you just want to have, you know, uh, control of the needle. Using a spinal or blunt needle with the obturator taken out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the spinal or the the quinky, which is what comes in those kits, you know, it's better than just your straight up hypodermic, you know, pulled from the cart kind of like 22 gauge needles. Um, you can potentially do that for some of your non-named sort of more peripheral nerves, just because you're not likely to get a, an intraneural injection in the same with the same frequency. But uh, you know, it's it's a uh, it's considered poor form or sort of what you'll see is you need the blunt tip or the non-cutting. Yeah. The, you mean like the ultrasound linear transducer? Oh, that's okay. I thought you were talking about like a transducer for pressure on the... Uh... Oh, uh, so you can do a pressure, so that uh, transducer, the inline sort of pressure gauge, the tire manometer, that can go sort of anywhere in your setup, right? So that can go sort of on the back of your needle between the tubing and the syringe. Or if you've got an aspirating syringe, then you can potentially hold your needle and syringe in one hand, and it would go in that case in between the syringe and the needle. Okay, just so that it's in line. Yeah. Yeah. So you're just in charge of making sure it's going in the right place, and you're saying, okay, you know, fire kind of thing, and you're just watching it uh, do the right thing. Okay. Uh, so we'll do some forearm nerve blocks. Um, and uh, basically, yes, you can do uh, uh, landmark-based blocks, but essentially at the wrist, you know, you, if you've got like this sort of mangled hand, you may want to sort of come up into the forearm to be sure that you get a few, uh, uh, a few things uh, in your hand a little bit better. So how do we do with the radial nerve? Radial nerve? <laughs> yeah. So pretty good, right? Yeah, so radial nerve here is, uh, is the yellow, so it's basically just the dorsal of the hand except for the very distal tips, right? So that's where your median wraps around, okay? So if you're doing fingernails and you're doing perinicia, median nerve, okay? All right, good. Uh, all right, so here's your median. So obviously there's your indications, multiple lacerations, large uh, avulsions. Uh, you'll get your sensory to the digits and sometimes you'll get motor a little bit easier with this, uh, with this block. So that's why you know, potentially you can splint them in a protected position uh, if you're sending them out. So here's your carpal tunnel. Okay. The honeycomb of my nerve is just right here, right? And these little guys here, those are all tendons. It's a little bit easier to tell the difference. We'll sort of throw that on there. Okay. All right. This is your setup essentially. So you put them on the, you position them appropriately. They're on a monitor. Scan the area. Make sure that there's no contraindications that you see. Do your prep. Sterile cover, tegaderm, uh, the transducer, and sterile, uh, sterile coupling agent, um, uh, gel. And then you just do the procedure, boop. You scan, rock until you see the nerves it's attending. You can use an out of plane or an in plane approach as long as you're visualizing the needle tip. The good thing about the median nerve is there's really kind of nothing around it that's sort of super, super sensitive. So if you're just starting out and you don't really have the whole like, I can see my needle target and visual plane, a median nerve block is in the forearm is actually a pretty good starting point to sort of start to get accustomed to what you're, what you're up to. Okay, and so hopefully we'll have the same thing here. <clears throat> so th don't hit that. Um, median nerve. Ah, no. Okay. And you'll see him come in. Oh, I'm going this way. Nope. Redirect. And then you'll sort of see you're just working through the bellies of these muscles until you get right to the point where you're jabby jabbing the uh, uh, underneath. Yeah, this is all the anesthetists. I don't know if they're sort of, uh, this is just sort of, I feel like it's super aggressive. Maybe they're using like their, um, their electrical stimulator as well to just a higher degree of comfort. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, they're just going at it. I guess maybe they like to <laughs> make the patient say, yep, that's where it is. 
But essentially, as you come in and out of plane, this is sort of what your needle will look like, right? If you're not totally on plane, you'll get this sort of this side image of it, and then it'll look brighter as you're coming in and out of plane. So for example, you actually maybe see this better than you see the needle tip, right? And then it'll, it'll pin, oh, and there's my needle tip, right? And so that's just sort of incomplete over, over the top of the, ner of the uh, vessel uh, needle. Yeah, yeah, right? There's no way the patient is enjoying this process. Yeah, yeah. So that's not what I would, that's why I mentioned that, is like this, this seems a lot of, uh, uh, yeah, this seems uh, very thorough. <laughs> Probably an orthopod did it. No, I'm just kidding. Okay. Uh, so ulnar nerve block. This is sort of good because uh, this is one of the ones that is really good for hand fractures. So your boxers fractures, that sort of stuff. If you don't want to do a hematoma block or any of that stuff, then the ulnar nerve will actually give you pretty good anesthesia to those lateral digit, to those ulnar digits. Um, and then obviously, uh, uh, if you're draining like abscesses, that kind of stuff, and you're worried about uh, 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 local injection, you can do the your, your regional blocks. So there's your ulnar nerve. And your radial uh, nerve and your ulnar nerve are radial and ulnar to the arteries respectively. Okay, so which side is it on? Medial, lateral, or is he like this? Is he like that? Right? Uh, it's radi the radial nerve is radial to the radial artery. The ulnar nerve is ulnar to the ulnar artery. Okay, does that make sense? All right. And then I think, yeah, so here we go. There's your uh, artery. Right, and again, some anisotropy. These little guys, flexor culpi ulnaris, and there's your character right there. They're not all going to be that obvious. Here's your setup, though. Same thing. Look for contraindications. Prep. Do it sterilely. Try not to spit on your field. And go. So there's your artery, ulnar nerve. And in plane versus out of plane, and that's your target. And we'll see this video as well. And then we'll see how, how, how much longer we can do. I can do this all day, but um, no one wants that. So again, artery, getting in there. Yeah. Can you feel me now? Can you feel me now? Can you feel me now? Right? So this is I actually like because that is a very clear situation of I'm on one side of the fascia versus a different side of the fascia. Did everyone see that? So basically they started to inject and they saw their injection out through here. So they went a little bit further and now their injection is in there and it's surrounding the nerve. Yeah? Um, I remember reading or maybe it was an MRAP that uh, getting within the fascial sheet actually does not um, change so much how effective your block is. Uh, which block? Yeah, I mean potentially, right? It could still work, right? For from diffusion and 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 all that, but but the idea of uh, of visualizing and trying to get within the fascial sheath is um, um, the idea there is you can potentially get a same uh, a, a better block with less uh, anesthetic. Um, if you don't sort of see yourself in the fascial sheath and sort of the sheath in the same way that they sort of demonstrated here, you know, you probably could still have a pretty good block. And they're actually showing this whole donut thing where they get around the entire thing, which also people say you don't really need that, right? Because essentially if you get it in the right space, it's just going to diffuse out. Um, I would argue, uh, so, so I don't know that M EM wrap, uh, but uh, I'm not, and I'm not sure sort of uh, how they check that, but I think that most of the time when we talk about having a failed block, it's because we think we're not in the place where we, th where we ought to be. Um, if you have enough anesthetic, then I guess it diffuses out. I mean, in fact, that's what blind technique was, right? It just, this is about where the nerve is, so I'm just going to put a bunch of lo local in there, and sometimes the block works, right? So, uh, so I, I can't, I don't know, I can't speak intelligently to that, but in general you want to you get into the, the fascial plane just so that your anesthetic tracks up and down because it's the longitudinal length of nerve that's, that's most, most important. Yep? Uh, so with 
with the fascia layout, you were saying like sometimes you might compress it distally just to allow it more time. Did you ever do that with any of these blocks? No. I mean, because this is the nerve that you care about. In the fascia iliaca, you're using your femoral nerve as sort of a marker, but like the obturator, yeah, nerve and all that off the lumbar plexus, they're further back up the inguinal <laughs> crease, inguinal canal. And when you're talking about like pressure and monitoring pressures, it's like you do not inject into the nerve at all. Right. So. Th Right. So if you're injecting right up against a fascial plane, like right up against the, the fascia, then you'll have high pressure, right? So if you're sort of in the thing and you, you know, if you've gotten to where you think you need to be and you're injecting uh, and you notice that, you're, uh, that your pressure is too high, it's one of those two things. You either don't know where your needle tip is and it's uh, uh, in, the, in the nerve itself, or it's just a budding you know, the, uh, the uh, fascial plane. It's kind of like uh, if the uh, NG tube, the stomach wall just sort of goes right next to, like, you know, it's, you can't push anything out because you have to push away the fascial uh, plane with pressure in order to inject anything. So you just reposition. You can come out a little bit, reposition. If you can see that you're not where you need to be, then you can go further to try to get through that fascia, you know, uh, to try to get into the space that, that is a potential space that you can create with your fluid. Does that make sense? Okay. I mean, it's basically it's like, that's not going to work out, right? Okay. Okay, radial nerve, uh, all that good stuff. I kind of want to skip down to the posterior tibial sciatic block and we'll stop there just because I think that that might be useful. But the radial nerve, uh, same kind of nonsense. Um, you have multiple different areas where you can, uh, where you can inject uh, and localize the nerve. Um, and these are just sort of other effects where you see sort of around your nerve this growing area. Your tip is just there and you're seeing the nerve kind of get, get smushed down with some of the fluid, right? <sighs> All right, all that stuff, many of these things. Okay, and here's your sciatic, okay? So your sciatic is basically the posterior calf and leg, so your tendon ruptures, issues here, and actually it's your foot apart from this medial aspect, all right? So you wanna be careful about uh, doing the sciatic nerve block uh, for a big ankle fracture if you know that this is the guy that's not covered by your sciatic nerve or your posterior tib. Okay, and if you want to do that, then you need your saphenous nerve and we'll get to it. Okay, so your pop, you basically hit the distal sciatic in the popliteal fossa where the tibial and the common peroneal meet. These guys can split for higher up as well, so you may see both of them in the pop, okay? And we'll see what that looks like. Like I say, all, all the words you'll, I'll, I'll give you all later, but essentially you're doing a DVT study and you're identifying your, uh, your nerve and you choose your depth, you do your, your skin wheel, you sort of uh, go in. <coughs> yeah, like you can have them, you can do it not prone, but it's just super easier to have them prone. And in particular, if you're thinking about like a big dislocation, maybe you want them prone just so your gravity is pushing you in the right place of your ankle anyway. Okay, so needle tip, all that stuff. So here we are. And you'll see that here, this is beginning, this is ending. You, we get a little bit of air in here, but whatever. Um, you basically have your tibial and your peroneal. So this is just right at the bifurcation. They just, you know, you can go a little bit higher, maybe try to get them both. But you'll see this fluid and it's just kind of coming into this space, coming around this nerve, coming around this nerve. Yep. And then the posterior tibial block, right? So. Traditionally, landmarks, you just go back here and try not to hit an artery. Okay, fair enough. Uh, but with ultrasound, if you identify yourself here and you identify your nerve here along with the artery, you can move up and into this part of the leg where the artery and the nerve are separated, and you just block at that point, and, you'll get a, uh, and it's a little bit of an easier block to, uh, to avoid hitting the artery. The other thing that's kind of nice about coming up higher is you can get the branch of the calcaneal nerve. So calcaneal fractures, which are super, super painful, um, and you know you, you don't really have much you can do about blocking or, or, or anything with those. You can actually, if you go high enough into the tibial, you can block there and you'll get pain uh, relief with a calcaneal fracture. 
Okay, so when would you do that? Um, essentially, in these situations. So this is all for your plantar foot um, problems, right? Plantar foreign bodies or lacerations. You don't put uh, injected uh, lido into the foot. You come up, you do your, your distal sciatic or your posterior tibial, and you'll get uh, good anesthesia, and you can muck around in the bottom of the foot, remembering that sort of the very, very medial part is your sural, and you may not catch that. Okay, but for the most part, ball the foot, heal the foot, you'll be fine. And then uh, that's that posterior tibial we talked about. Uh, and you also get the calcaneal. Okay, so basically those are the, and then we'll skip all that because that's, that's exciting. So basically those are kinds of the, uh, the blocks that I would uh, uh, be uh, aware of. This is your distribution for your scaling. So it's not totally phallus shaped, but I understand what you were trying to do there. Um, <laughs> Longer than it is wide. Okay, good. Uh, so, so here you are. This is your stoplight. Um, we'll, uh, I kind of want to just uh, leave it there to let you guys out, and I'll sort of stop for any questions. But like I said, this handout and all that stuff will be available uh, via Menender. Um, and then that's, uh, that's finally, uh, I think that's the end of that lecture. So these uh, uh, people, you have your sort of dual-headed cerebus here. And then uh, this is them working real hard at SAM in 2013. They've been outed. Okay, any questions?